I'm sitting at an intersection in my neighborhood, back against a cafe, coffee in hand. There are no planes in the sky, no cars driving by. It's May 2020, early in the pandemic. And as I sit at this empty intersection, I think, man, you could safely stage a ballet in this intersection. I could literally lie on the ground and watch the clouds go by and not get run over. Seeing spaces like these without cars on them has been such an interesting experiment, I think, for most of us. And for me, it's helped me see them fundamentally differently, to think, what else might we use these spaces for? Who else? Responding to COVID-19 has pushed us to reimagine our public spaces really quickly. And by public space, I mean streets and pathways and parks and plazas, parking lots, transit stations. We've made room for more people on bikes and walking. We've made room for restaurants spilling out into the street. And this has really helped bring the point home for me that the way we design our public spaces and who and what we design them for are a series of choices that we make. And given the opportunity to rethink these choices, would we make the same ones? So our public spaces for walking, for eating, for these deer, are they for protests? Are they for naps? Are they for markets, for people in cars, people in wheelchairs, bike posses? kids getting to school for your 2021 COVID staycation. Currently in most North American cities, about half of the land is dedicated to cars. And in some Calgary communities, this goes up closer to 70%. Why is that? And for some of us, this might seem intuitive. We have places to go. We need to get our kids to soccer, get to work, go to the mall, get out of town. But mounting evidence suggests there are downsides to prioritizing cars over other uses. We're walking less and driving more, and that's contributing to chronic disease, the leading cause of death in Canada. We're polluting more. We're emitting more greenhouse gases at a time when we're trying to reduce them by 80%. We're more isolated. We are contributing to inequity. Our lower income and racialized communities have less green space and less walkable infrastructure and we're paving paradise at a time when we want to mitigate floods and face our biodiversity crisis. And it's for reasons like these that some cities are targeting reductions in the amount of space they dedicate to cars. So what would happen if we started sharing some of this space with other uses? Well, we might be healthier, and we might be more senior friendly, and we might do better at work and better in school, and we could chip away at our carbon footprint. And we might have more fun. And we might have more money. So how does the design of our cities start to capture these benefits? Well, we know we can design places that invite us to walk and invite us to bike and socialize. And it turns out this comes with a whole host of other benefits. But first, how do we design for more walking and socializing? And I like to remember it this way. People are lazy but curious. So we like our shortcuts, but we'll take a long way around if it's particularly lovely. We need great pathways and nearby convenient destinations. We want a feeling of safety. We will linger in places where there is beauty or excitement or mystery, and we're more likely to go to places that have shade and greenery, bathrooms, drinking water. So can we design for that? My colleagues and I work with communities to imagine what design change could look like. And so we do a lot of dreaming with communities and we do a lot of drawing. We do some prototyping and we've worked on some permanent projects. So for example, we reimagined a boulevard to make space for people on bikes and people on foot. And we've imagined roads where kids are the primary users. And we've helped communities build new pathways and retrofit existing ones. And a great example of that are these pedestrian cut-throughs we see in Calgary's residential neighborhoods. And these are spaces with such great potential, but they don't always feel safe, and they don't always feel inviting, and they're not always accessible. So we worked with kids to reimagine catwalks. And we did this on a temporary basis using what we call tactical urbanism. Uh, 
using temporary furniture, pallets, temporary lighting, paint, to make some changes. And the community responded really positively to these, and we started seeing more use of these spaces. So then we went to designers to say, well, can you help us imagine what permanent change would look like to make these spaces accessible and safe and beautiful so that they feel like first-class infrastructure, and so they would be someone's number one transportation choice. We think about car-free zones. So it was about two years ago that I was walking through our university campus, and suddenly it struck me, why do I feel so nice right now? And I realized that there was very little in my immediate vicinity that could kill me. And there was no noise and there was no pollution. Cars are heavy and fast and polluting, and people are soft and slow with sensitive lungs. So why are we always placed next to each other? A project that spun off of our work was led by Dutch students that we invited to work with us to help push our boundaries and make us a little uncomfortable. And they suggested tearing up this neighborhood boulevard and planting it with trees and grasses so that it becomes this great walking boulevard. It helps calm traffic in the neighborhood. It creates ecological corridors throughout. And the community thought it was pretty cool. We think about parking lots. And so in one underused parking lot where the neighborhood really wanted a local hangout and they wanted coffee, we decided to test that out and to create this market with a local coffee shop. But then we started questioning the idea of parking lots altogether, which are so often sited on high value land and are used sporadically. And so rather than having parking lots, could we have plazas? And the uses of these plazas shift over the course of the day, over the course of the week, as needs change. So sometimes it's a promenade, sometimes it's a market, sometimes it's for food trucks, sometimes it's an event venue, sometimes it's parking, and sometimes it's all of those things at once. We've thought a lot about transit stations because we hear so much feedback about what people want at transit stations, and that is accessibility by walking, convenient shops on site, and a sense of safety. And we've thought about abandoned railways and turning those into pathways, and then turning those pathways into the backbone of new developments, sustainable developments. And lastly, we've been thinking about laneway and parkway housing to address the need for multi-generational housing in some of the neighborhoods we work with. And we think about the system systems of lanes and pathways and parks that help support that walking infrastructure. So you might be getting the point. There are a lot of possibilities here, and I could go on, but I won't. What do these possibilities afford us? Interesting places, healthier places, and a competitive city. And I want to talk about that last one for just a moment. Excess car use does cost us. And we haven't been very good at taking that into account. It's not often on the balance sheet. It costs us in physical inactivity. And by the way, the larger share of that is in lost productivity. The rest is in healthcare costs. There's congestion, air pollution, collisions, additional infrastructure and services. But we can start to flip that. And when we do, we also see additional benefits. So in the US, Canada, and Australia, Local businesses near walking infrastructure and green spaces see higher sales. And similarly, with real estate values for commercial and residential properties, they go up as they are located near walkable infrastructure and green spaces. And so you might ask, well, isn't that just contributing to gentrification? Aren't we just making housing more expensive for those who live near great public spaces? And you might be right, yes. But consider that if Calgarians could go with one less car in their lives because we have great active travel infrastructure or transit, the number of communities we could afford to buy a house in increases by 1,700%. Livable places are also competitive places. So even before the pandemic, we were seeing uh, a trend towards remote work. And what does that mean? It means towns and cities are competing based on livability walkable infrastructure, green space, great public schools. 
And if we, if we think about where Amazon wanted to locate its headquarters, what they wanted for their employees was healthy places, happy places, and connected places. And in Calgary, we said, well, we would be willing to fight a bear for this Amazon bid. And that was great. But in 2021, can we ask ourselves, are we willing to keep investing in places people want to move to, live in, and stay in? The way we've designed cities may have seemed obvious, with some of our larger investments going into car infrastructure. But the data is telling us something new. It's telling us we need to shift. And part of that is reimagining how we use our public spaces. And this is particularly important as hopefully we recover from this pandemic and economic recession for three reasons. The most vulnerable among us, first of all, have been the most impacted. And that includes lower income Canadians, BIPOC Canadians, and new Canadians. And we can help in part by creating great, affordable, convenient transportation options. And secondly, we can be a competitive city by being a livable city. And finally, we can leverage what we've learned from this last year to meet the challenges of our century, which include climate change, biodiversity loss, and chronic disease. We've proven to ourselves we can adapt really quickly, and we have what it takes to face these new challenges. So how do we feel about change? Are we excited? Do we feel wary? Is there a sense of loss at the idea of change? And these questions are critical because they affect whether and how we do change. Some changes are easy. We've re responded uh, fairly seamlessly to smartphones. Adapting our neighborhoods might feel different. You've heard the expression, not in my backyard, or NIMBY. And I can relate. I've had NIMBY sentiments before. My parents live in a neighborhood where I grew up that is changing. And for a time, I didn't want any of it. It felt like change was erasing my history. But as I talked about it, I realized that I wanted people to know my stories. And I wanted them to know that my life had had meaning there and that I had belonged there. And then I realized that being part of change can also be meaningful to me and contribute to my stories in this place. And change can be meaningful for generations to come who are making their own lives in that place and making their own stories. So how do we move forward from here? Well, firstly, we need to acknowledge the data is telling us that, ch that the change is called for. And secondly, we can talk about it. We need to talk about it. The best solutions are rooted in dialogue. And that's because we can shape solutions to each other's needs and wants. And more often than not, that means coming up with ideas we wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And thirdly, we can experiment. Get involved in our communities, build something, see how it feels, adapt accordingly. And finally, we can commit to lasting change. And that means investing in diverse public spaces for diverse people. And it means making sure the right expertise is at the table. And those experts might be people like you and me. And it might be people who know about health, people who know about mental health, transportation planning, big picture economics. We're at a critical period of time right now in 2021. And from my perspective, what we need is a just city and a competitive city and a resilient city. And building great public spaces that we want to live in and move in helps us get there. Thank you. <laughs>